I'm John Hunter, and I'm the product director of AI operations at GSK. My product is called Knowledge Graph, and it's a highly connected RDF graph database that houses all of the world's scientific and medical knowledge extracted from documentation within some of the world's, most of the world's uh, medical and um, scientific knowledge bases. What I'd like to introduce is our approach to Knowledge Graph at GSK. Um, we'll start with a bit of an intro of drug R&D. Um, from there, we'll go to why a Knowledge Graph, and we'll also review the way we are storing Knowledge Graph data at GSK, how we're querying our data, and an introduction to an open source library that we've built in partnership with 47 Degrees um, called Bellman, which is a Sparkle library. And I'll walk through a quick demo of how that works and a little bit about the future, where we're headed uh, within GSK with regards to Knowledge Graph. So it's good to have a little bit of a background of drug and vaccine R&D. It takes about 12 to 15 years to bring a drug or a vaccine to market. And there are different phases in this uh, drug pipeline. We're going to focus on the research stage of this talk because that's where I work. Um, so if you can imagine a timeline moving from left to right, all of these different phases from research, preclinical, clinical trials are different phases in the research and development of medicines and vaccines. So the focus of my work is on the research part, which is generally about two to three year process of scientists finding uh, new medicines and new approaches that can possibly be a target for, for new drugs and new treatments. So if you could imagine that if we could shave off a year or two off of each of these phases, um, we can bring new life-saving drugs to market much quicker. Um, mind you, this is under normal circumstances. Um, also of note, um, it's interesting, 5% of drugs that actually make it into human trials, which is this third piece here, um, about 5% of them make it through to the actual government agency review. So it's a very high risk, um, very costly process. So any time savings we can have along the way um, will greatly benefit both the company and humanity. So there are typical R&D uh, use cases uh, for data. And the way we can accelerate each one of these stages in the drug pipeline is to uh, work with data at scale. So there are different use cases that we have. Uh, the first is Discover, where this is mostly the individual scientist querying for data and just looking for new insights and new information on diseases and treatments so that they can come up with some new drug target or some novel approach to treating a disease. The ENCODE and the PREDICT use cases are more along the lines of the AIML use case where machines uh, in the ENCODE use case, machines create representations that they can understand at scale. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of, uh, sorry, billions of data points um, that are encoded for machine consumption. And for the predict use case, that is more along the lines of um, inferring links in data that don't exist, but may or should exist. So um, more along the lines of a machine learning type or inferencing type of use case. So there's lots of different data sources that scientists work with. Um, most of them are structured data sources and unstructured data sources. The structured data sources are the structured data sources are generally um, sources like Wikidata, um, some other NIH-funded programs um, that store um, different types of data from genes to diseases to proteins, and then unstructured data, and those are just white papers um, in repositories such as Elsevier and PubMed. So 
data, data scientists and traditional scientists are in this dilemma of how do they unify and manage all of this siloed data. Uh, what we've found is that a knowledge graph really fits this use case well, where we can connect data and federate it and integrate it in such a way that is both accessible by humans and by machines alike. So we went through um, sort of the problem statement and a little bit of why a knowledge graph, but let's go into some more detail around um, why exactly is a knowledge graph a good fit and how does it connect disparate data sources together? So in a knowledge graph um, connections, the atomic unit in a knowledge graph is the RDF triple, which is um, two, piece, two pieces of data connected by a predicate, where the knowledge piece comes in with knowledge graph is the actual connection itself is encoded with meaning. So this meaning can be used both by humans and machine alike to not only connect facts and connect entities in the system, but also inscribe meaning to those connections, where in a traditional database, these connections have of an implicit meaning, but in a knowledge graph, all connections are, are explicit. Um, not only they are, are they explicit, they're required and expected. So joins in a relational database are expensive. Federating data is expensive in a traditional database. In a knowledge graph, it's the norm. We're expected to bring in disparate data sources together. So as you can see here with this simple diagram, you can see how we can bring sources of uh, data from disease databases, gene knowledge graphs, compounds, um, pharmaceutical classes, and connect those all together into one cohesive unit that can be queried and, and joined pretty easily. So a natural question is why a knowledge graph built on Spark? And the answer is that GSK has done a lot of research on different graph data stores that are out there. And um, they've either uh, failed our requirements one way or another, either um, data ingress or data egress uh, failed, or um, some of the data stores failed cap theorem where the availability just wasn't there for us. Uh, we wanted to build a highly available system. And um, just the sheer size of our knowledge graph, we have currently about 500 billion connections and they're growing daily as we get incremental data from some of these uh, data extractions, uh, specifically from uh, the unstructured data where we're using NLP to extract facts out of scientific literature. This is a big contributor to our data growth. Um, high read write throughput we covered because that that's the, the that's the ml and ai use case where we're just reading and writing lots and lots of data either to train a model or write encoded data back into the knowledge graph that's machine readable and of course spark is a mature tech and has a fantastic oss community um, so might be worth talking a little bit about uh, knowledge graph data uh, RDF is the foundation of most knowledge graphs, and it's the foundation of the knowledge graph that GSK has built. It stands for the Resource Definition Framework, and it is uh, it's standard for describing linked data on the web and uses URIs as identifiers, um, which is a really effective way to uniquely identify um, data within our system. The way um, Many times the data is linked to an actual resource on the web. So if you paste a URI and a knowledge graph into a web browser, you many times will get information. It's not required, but a lot of knowledge graph data vendors actually do that. And some of the um, open source uh, data sets that are out there actually do link to um, an actual web page. Wikidata is a famous uh, example of that. So RDF triples uh, come in different flavors, and we support the N triple format, which is a really simple flat structure that works really well in Apache Spark. It's a splittable format. Other formats are XML, Turtle, 
and some other formats that are non-splittable. We chose RDF triples because they are splittable and can easily be ingested into Spark in a, a highly parallelized way and processed in a highly parallelized way. And N triple format fits really nicely into tables in Spark. So we've got our subject predicate object triples that are represented just by three simple columns. And also included is an optional graph position, which indicates, at least in our knowledge graph at GSK, where that data came from. So data lineage is encoded right into each and every triple in the graph. And what's great about that is that we can partition on those graphs so that we could prune the amount of data that we're querying. So if a end user is interested in only a part of the data, we can actually target that specific uh, graph and load only that data, um, speeding up queries. And then as a secondary partition, we could partition on the P column, which is a lower cardinality column, which allows us to um, really, really speed up queries, especially for queries that specify that P position. There's lots of different ways to represent data in a knowledge graph on disk. Uh, the data structure we chose is just one gigantic SPO table. It's very easy to manage. And with Spark's um, partitioning, you, we, get the we get the best of both worlds. We get a single table, which is easy to deal with. And we can also get data partitioning um, in the form of graph and predicate partitioning. There are also some other requirements that we were looking at and would like to have, such as acid transactions, um, atomic writes. So if a write fails in the middle, we want to be able to roll back and um, start, the, start the write again without having to deal with a data spill. And isolated reads, if a user is reading from the data store in the middle of a write, they'll get consistent results. Um, Dedupe. Uh, knowledge graphs tend to have lots of duplication of triples. It's expected not only between data sets, but also within data sets, just the nature of the way uh, uh, RDF is queried and written. And incremental queries is also a additional requirement. And there are data extractions that can handle this for us, such as Apache Hootie and Delta Lake. We've looked into both. Uh, we're going with Apache Hootie. Uh, because of compatibility with our um, on-prem systems. So to query a knowledge graph, Sparkle is the de facto standard. And it's a very simple uh, language to learn, which is why we have chosen it as our interface to our knowledge graph. It's a very SQL-like language. Many of our data scientists and, and uh, biologists know SQL. So learning Sparkle is very easy. It also provides some really nice language features for creating subgraphs, which is a large part of what we do with our knowledge graph. If you could imagine a knowledge graph of 500 billion triples, it's not quite, um, it's not qu convenient to query 500 billion triples. Uh, when you're just looking for one or two results, what we generally do is we'll create a subgraph, load that into a lower latency system like Neo4j or Blaze Graph or something faster um, in order to do uh, faster, more transactional type queries. So one of the pieces that we were missing was how do we query, how do we write Sparkle queries and have those execute on Apache Spark? Uh, there were no commercial offerings that allow us to do this. There are some open source offerings, not that run on Spark, well, one does. However, um, we were looking at packages like Apache Jenna and Blaze Graph, which don't run on Spark, but could provide Sparkle querying features. And Sansa Stack, which is a actual library that allows users to execute Sparkle queries on RDF data on Apache Spark. And this is this is the work of Jens Lehman and his team at the University of Bonn. And a lot of our work was inspired by 
um, his team's work and uh, the Sansa stack framework. So we've adopted a lot of those pieces that they've built and incorporated it into our own and also took care to make sure that our features work with Sansa stack so that we could interoperate uh, with their with some of their excellent libraries. So um, due to this, uh, because we have this requirement to run Sparkle queries on Apache Spark, we decided to roll our own uh, Sparkle engine. That Sparkle engine is called Bellman. It's an open source project that's sponsored by GSK and um, is developed with uh, in partnership with 47 Degrees. Um, here's the URL to the Bellman repository. Um, please have a look at it. Um, please contribute, star, comment, um, open up bug reports. We're looking for um, people to help us uh, grow and expand and improve the library. So the architecture for the Bellman, uh, the Bellman Sparkle engine has a bunch of different stages. So the first stage is to take in a Sparkle query and parse it, turn it into an abstract syntax tree. And then from there, we can, cre we can create an algebraic data type, which is a recursive structure that gets passed over to a compiler, um, which, the, which takes that uh, algebraic data type and turns it into um, Spark, Spark data frame and Spark uh, data set operations. Um, made a little bit of a mistake here. These are out of order. Uh, the optimize, uh, no, actually they're in the right order. Static analysis is where we do some last minute checking to make sure that um, there are no logical errors in the code that was passed before it's actually optimized. Um, we have some optimizations that we do in some in Sparkle queries where we compress certain statements down into one statement, reduce the amount of scans over data, because that can be very expensive. Once all of that optimization static analysis is done, we pass it over to the engine, which executes the code on Apache Spark, and then a formatter, which formats the output. That gives us control over the type of data uh, that is uh, produced uh, from the engine. So all the different uh, RDF formats like N triples or XML. So we've got a bit of a demo set up and would like to walk you through it and we will step over there now. So we've got a Databricks notebook set up here. We've got a cluster fired up. We've got the Bellman Sparkle libraries loaded up as well into the cluster and we are ready to go. So this first section here is just some imports and we're initializing the Jenna library, which we're using uh, to do a lot of the heavy work and lifting behind, um, behind our engine. So a lot of the lower level RDF formatting and checking to make sure that RDF is valid. Uh, we do a lot of that using the Jenna library. It's, it's a lot of work with heuristics and trial and error when it comes to making sure your RDF data is properly formatted. Jenna's done a lot of that for us already, so why not use it? So command two here is where we're loading our knowledge graph. So what I've loaded here is Wikidata. It is the latest Truthy Wikidata variant, which is a version of Wikidata. It's all RDF, um, but it's a version of Wikidata where the facts are, each of the facts within the knowledge graph itself are of a certain above a certain threshold of quality. So we want to make sure that the facts within our knowledge graph are at least verified by experts. And that is the latest truthy data set. So we've loaded that. Um, I've pre run a lot of these commands because some of them take a little bit of time. So this command takes three minutes. So I've pre run it just to show how many triples are in the graph. There are over 5 billion. So, which is why it took about two minutes to count them. If we print the schema, we can see that SPO columns and pretty simple, simple data structure. Uh, let's just 
to show that this is this is just a normal data frame that we've loaded data into. Let's just you know see the top ten. So we've got that here. Now, what we've done is we've imported the Bellman libraries. What that gives us is this nice Sparkle syntax on our data frames that we can just call and inline a Sparkle query and run it. So we can do that. You can see that that ran. We get identical results to the, um, the, the select star limit here. And if we go into the actual job itself, just to look at the um, look at the SQL that was generated. So Spark read the first 10,000 um, triples and just returned 10 just to show you how we're doing it in the development engine. It's very similar. We're reading 10,000 triples. We have an extra project statement here and then collecting the output. Um, very similar approach and uh, works very similarly to, um, to the, Sparkle, the, the, the Spark SQL counterpart. So, now we can start exploring our knowledge graph now that we've established that it's been loaded and all is working well. So this first query, um, we're just gonna find all gene variants within Wikidata um, that are positive prognostic indicators of, and I chose pancreatic cancer. Um, and what, what a positive progno prognostic indicator is, is it's, it's a positive outcome for a patient when a certain gene variant is present. So this query here just shows how we can query the knowledge graph for that information. Um, so we're also querying, we're querying which variant has a prog positive prognostic indicator for pancreatic cancer, but we're also saying, don't only give us the variant, also give us the gene as well and return that in a table. And that's what we see here. So we can see the variant What's really cool about this is that you can select the actual URI, paste it, and you can get more information about the gene. Um, really, really nice feature of RDF and knowledge graphs that um, really play nice with uh, scientists and with uh, literature. So really nice way to query and to learn more about what it is you're querying within your knowledge graph. Um, so that gave us one result out of all of the 5 billion triples. Let's just check against Wikidata and see if we get the same result there. So Wikidata provides this nice Sparkle query service. So let's run that query. As you can see, one result. Uh, Wikidata is formatting their data a little bit differently than the way we're formatting it, uh, but the actual IDs should match up. So 213, 961, 922. 213.961.922. So we're in parity with Wikidata that proves that um, our, our Sparkle engine is working correctly. Uh, yeah. So now that we've been able to query one gene variant, next query just kind of gives us, tell me, gives us all of the gene variants. Like, let's see if we could find all of the gene variants that are positive prognostic indicators of a particular disease. When we run that query, we get uh, many more results, getting 96 rows here. From there, we can just start querying other aspects of the knowledge graph. Um, so the goal here is what we're doing is we're exploring the knowledge graph and figuring out how we could, um, the goal is to create what I would like to create is a, um, let's just say search on diseases. So let, let's say we want to have the ability to input a disease name and get back all kinds of semantic information about that disease name. So it's kind of what I'm driving at here, doing a little bit of exploration here to see what's in the graph. So from there, um, now that we've got our positive prognostic indicators, let's see what Gene variants um, have a positive therapeutic indicator, meaning which gene, which presence of which gene variants 
uh, has a positive effect on a disease uh, when a certain um, therapy is applied. So we can query the graph for that data and get that back. Um, we get quite a bit of data there. There seems to be a lot of um, a lot of drug data within Wikidata. That's kind of cool. So from there, um, if we want to be able to create a function that takes a disease as an input and provides um, all kinds of semantic information about that disease as an output, we want to make sure that we could, in fact, query all the diseases uh, within the the Wikidata knowledge graph and you know get all the drugs that are used for uh, to treat that disease. So that's what this query is doing, giving us all back all of those rows. So now um, we have a nice nice set of queries to start putting it all together into this function to um, allow us to do uh, disease search. So this is how we'll put it all together. Um, Sparkle has a really nice syntax called construct. What that does is it creates a new knowledge graph from the data that you're querying in your where clause. So what we're doing here is we are putting all of the queries that we had uh, that we had uh, query, uh, putting all the queries that we had put together above all together, and then taking all of those results and constructing a new graph that is optimized for disease search. So if you see here, I'm, con I'm creating new triples uh, with disease as the subject position, which gives us the ability to query very quickly on diseases. So as you can see, this will give us a nice little data set that we can query diseases on. Some really nice aspects of RDF and Knowledge Graph is using what are called ontologies. And ontologies are specifications for naming things. And they're generally agreed upon by um, different industries. So there are disease ontologies, there are gene ontologies. There are many different names for individual genes. If we stick to a specific ontology, and if others stick to those specific ontologies, we're all calling things the same name. It allows us to query uh, data in between knowledge graphs, which is one of the really important things when it comes to knowledge graph. You want your data to be interoperable to knock down those silos of data. So we're using the disease ontology and we're using the simple knowledge organization namespace to create a nice, uh, a nice graph for us ourselves to query that is standards based and will interoperate. So we can run that query, and we can get back our our graph that is diseases with all of the associated genes, gene variants, treatments. Um, and some other nice links like Ensemble ID, which is a, another gene database that gives us additional information about certain genes. So from there, um, we've got our knowledge graph. We've got it in memory. Um, we've created that uh, graph data frame. So now let's create our literature search query. So now we want to create a, qu a query that takes a disease name and returns all the information we have about that disease. So that's what this query does here, uh, where we'll call our function literature search. It takes a query as the uh, first parameter and a data frame as a second parameter and outputs a data frame. So that output data frame will be the results of searching on a specific disease. So what we'll do is we will search uh now that we have our uh, literature search function we can search on we'll search on pancreatic cancer again that should give us our results and we get our disease our disease name pancreatic cancer um, associated genes associated gene variants so this is just like a really simple uh demonstration of how we can create these subgraphs very very quickly that allow us to um, creates specialized data structures and specialized graphs for a particular purpose. If we search for breast cancer, we get a lot more results. It's a very, very well-researched um, cancer and lots of information there. 
um, along with the associated gene variant and associated treatments. So that's the end of the demo, and hope that gives you a good idea of how we can run Sparkle queries uh, in Apache Spark and how we're how we're about how we're providing this service uh, to scientists within GSK. So that brings us to present day. Uh, we are working on completing the Sparkle 1.1 language specification. We're optimizing our queries to make the queries run, run faster. We are optimizing data on disks the way we're organizing our data based on the types of queries that scientists are submitting. And um, also point in time queries and incremental queries, which libraries like Apache Hootie and Databricks Delta gives us. So thank you. Here are the links to the open source library. We'll hope you'll join us there and star the repository, uh, submit uh, bug reports and pull requests. Thank you. And I will see you on GitHub. Thank you. Bye.